been a while of chatting already today. Yes. That was pretty fun. Do you think we're on live at the moment? I don't think so. Okay. They usually enter us in. Yeah. Well, I knew that there would be a moderator at some point showing up. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I think we'll have someone asking questions. Otherwise, we can just chat with each other. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Is we're, worst case, we do more of what we were already doing, and that's yeah. all right with me. That was like a, that was a lot of uh, really good time. Um. Oh, hey, Mark. Hey there. Sorry, I'm a minute late. Are you a moderator? I'm I'm your moderator. It's great to that's see you, fantastic. Kirsten. Fantastic! It's wonderful to see you. Um, I, my wife is not great. I hope it's not affecting us too much. You're a little jumpy. Yeah. My apologies. Um, great to have you both here. Um, the and we're, We've got a few people coming along and joining at the moment. Um, just like I have to turn off my headsets, which I've just decided to. Sorry. We do have this recording as well, so people in other time zones will be able to jump in and uh, share. Uh, so let's get started um, all the same while we're waiting for a few more people to join us. Do you both want to start by maybe describing a little bit about your role, but also I'd love to hear, I know that there is a bit of a buzz uh, around your work, so I'm just wondering if you could tell us, you know, why developers are so excited at the moment about Stargate. Um, I can I can take that one. Uh, so the thing is that, um, you know, um, most of the top Fortune 100 companies uh, rely on Cassandra as their as their database. Um, Netflix and Apple, um, a lot of they, they, they have, you know, they have a need for an amazing number of transactions has to be scalable and um, and they're willing to take uh, the hit on the on the developer side to kind of make sure that those schemas are set up correctly for them. But um, when you have open source developers, they don't necessarily understand Cassandra. And before uh, we came out with our um, our serverless version, in order to get started with Cassandra, you had to sort of figure out how the nodes connected and how to set them up. And there was a lot of fussy stuff. And now you can just push a button and get an asterisk um, Cassandra configuration, which is free for up to uh, like uh, 40 million reads, 5 million writes, um, uh, 40 gigs of space uh, every month. And um, it means that, you know, now all of a sudden we can provide a stack where you can go ahead and build your sample application, learn how Cassandra works, work with it and, and have, you know, a good experience. Stargate adds this uh, API layer as well, which um, puts REST and GraphQL and a document API on top of Cassandra. So you don't even need to learn CQL. You can just interface with it the way that you interface with your other data and um, it'll just work. So um, it, it's much more developer friendly, but it still has all those great things that Cassandra brings to the table. 
I think it's one of those technologies that um, developers need to have in their toolkit, like, you know, with Cassandra growing. So um, it's it's great that then you're removing the barriers to be able to get up to speed. Uh, and, and what are you seeing uh, is trends in what your customers are needing? Uh, yeah. Hi, Mark. Uh, thanks for moderating today. Um, and yeah, my, my role, I'm, I'm fairly recent to data stacks actually. And, uh, my role here is, this uh, developer experience architect, uh, which is a sort of a interesting <laughs> combination of words. Um, uh, Kristen and I actually spent some time on Twitter on a Twitter spaces thing today, talking about what this idea of de developer experience means. But, um, at the end of the day, what it means to me is, you know, helping developers get where they're trying to go, whatever that means. And in in data stacks context, it means, you know, that um, we are we're working on making uh, Cassandra as a service uh, more easily accessible in, in AstroDB, and we can do that with the Stargate layer. Um, so let's just take me as an example of being like a, a Node.js hacker, if you will, and like it's it's absolutely thrilling to think that like you know I can go in and um, you know, not have to worry too much about the the particulars of the data persistence layer of my app. I can just show up. I can write the code that I want to, which I'd rather spend more time I can spend doing node things, the happier I am. So I can hit up, um, you know, my choice of different, you know, the different API offerings that Stargate has. And that can be anything from a REST API, a document-based API, or GraphQL. And those offerings are going to continue to expand over time. So my role in all of this is simply to uh, make sure that uh, the APIs we're putting in front of developers are great and helps them get where they're trying to go. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot, a lot of cool stuff to unpack there over time. Kristen, it looks like we lost Mark. We lost Mark. <laughs> it's, it's bound to happen. He'll uh, come back. It's, yeah. I've known Mark for quite a while. He's, oh, he's awesome. Been. Yeah, I got the sense that you yeah. had met before. Yeah. We've, we've been all over the world at conferences together. So um, I, I do want to um, mention something uh, uh, that neither of us sort of touched on, which is that um, both Cassandra and Stargate are open source. Mm -hmm. So you can come and you can use the Astra instance to sort of figure out how, your way around Cassandra and around using Stargate. But if you want to run it on your own hard hardware, or if you want to, um, you know, throw it in the cloud with AWS, um, both Cassandra and Stargate can be used um, in, in this open source way. Uh, DataStax is committed. Actually, uh, I believe that our vision is to increase the usage and understanding of Cassandra throughout the community. So. Yes, we have products and we do sell them and they make money and they pay our, our bills, but um, we have many uh, of the of the core Cassandra uh, committers uh, work for DataStax and uh, almost all of the uh, Stargate uh, committers um, uh, also work for DataStax. So, so we're super committed to the open source nature. Um, we're not we're not giving you Astra so that you can, you know, be sucked into our product line. We're we're letting you try out, uh, uh, Cassandra out in an easy way. And then if what you want to do is run it yourself, then great, right? That's that's awesome. Well, fantastic. Thanks. Uh, and apologies for jumping off and go, jumping back on. My Wi-Fi uh, get, kicked me out. Um, the so with Cassandra, where? So you know, you describe Netflix, for example. Um, it's a it's a NoSQL database. What sets it apart from other sorts of NoSQL databases? And where is where are other particular industry sectors or any particular areas where it's strongest in that you're seeing is being behind some of the use cases? So the number of transactions that you get is incredible, right? Um, so uh, if you start with an Astra instance, uh, you'll have three nodes. Each of those nodes can do um, between four and 10,000 uh, transactions a second. Um, and then, and, and, it can, and, and the nice thing about the serverless is it will scale automatically as your traffic goes up. So if you get a spike, you know, we'll, we'll respond to that and we'll give you more resources and you'll just pay for the pieces that you use um, and, uh, and, and not for, for extra. Um, 
Cassandra um, has an amazing amount of uptime. It is designed to have zero downtime. And in fact, we do have some of our enterprise customers who have been using uh, the same uh, DSE uh, is our, our Dayzdex enterprise system. It, it's it's got the same backend, but you know, people, <laughs> and um, and uh, they've been using it for seven years um, without any downtime, zero downtime. Wow. Does, does that mean like it? So given the high level of transactions, it's for things. Is it for like uh, Internet of Things, for example? Like, would you run sensors? Um, you you know, we actually just started having a streaming um uh uh api uh service which is is great for iot sorts of things but i mean think about the apple um app store right um they just have an incredible number of transactions they have to have them all the time and and you can say you know i have there are 10 nodes and then i want each of um, it, it, I have 10 nodes in this data server, in this data center, and I want each of the pieces of information, each of the partitioning things to be on three nodes at once. So that means that it can use any of those three. Any request can go to any node and it'll figure out where to go get the information from. So it's extreme, extremely resilient. Um, it, it is, um, uh, we have financial customers who are super excited because they can't have any downtime and um, they, they need it to have good integrity. So um, it, um, and you can configure it to be, um, you know, the, the cap theory consistency, availability, and partitioning. Um, it's AP, right? So it's avail availability and partitioning. And the consistency, um, you can actually define as to whether it is eventually consistent or immediately consistent. Um, generally, what happens is if, for instance, you have uh, each piece of information on three nodes, then it'll wait until two of those nodes respond that they got that update before it will say it's done. But um, it's, uh, the, the main difference um, that you should really understand about Cassandra versus something like Oracle um, is that an Oracle database is designed based on the data, right? There's the data. This is what the database looks like. Here's the tables, right? Uh, Cassandra, the, the data is uh, defined based on what the expected queries will be. So a table is defined as the users by city or or something like that. So those queries will be blazingly fast, right? Because it's just got to go to one partition, pull the pieces out that it needs. Um, and so um, it's just, it's kind of a, it's, it's more of an API way, right? So you don't want your API to be your database schema, like exposed because it's just not very usable. You want it to be um, the queries that you want to support and and present them that way. So, so it brings developers closer to that design thinking mentality because you're thinking about how are people going to use, how are people going to query or pull it for their use case. So you end up moving more towards understanding the customer, which you exactly. can get caught up in when you're doing database design. And, oh, well, you can forget about when you're doing database design, no? Yes, yes. Um, it, it, it's a hard shift. For, for for some developers, but uh, the customers that we have who use Cassandra, um, you know, they they they've taken it to heart and uh, they do an amazing job with this. Cool. What about? Tell me about Craigslist. <laughs> oh yes, I was going to give Gash ask the next question, but I have to ask. Oh so, uh, no, I, I need to hear about this too. So <laughs> I, I actually um, interviewed at Craigslist. And I also interviewed at MongoDB, and. Um, and uh, one of the things that people don't realize about um, SQL databases is that um, they can't do everything. They just can't. And um, so Craigslist had a process, and this is how it worked. They had a MySQL da database, and then they had an archive database, right? And every three months, they would update their archive database so that it would have the same schema as their uh, main database, and then they would transfer the data over um, until one day uh, it turned out that the next alter table was going to take more than three months. So um, 
yeah that <laughs> i mean you know craigslist Craigslist didn't need all of the relational stuff. Like their data is very much documented or document oriented. If you look at it, it's like thing, it's like, you know, documents with tags and and references or whatever, but it's very JSON-y, right? But they were using MySQL because that was the thing. But at a certain point, it was just not gonna work for them anymore. So when you're picking a database, you know, that's one of the considerations. How is it gonna scale? When is it gonna stop scaling? What do I have to do when I get to that point? And, um, you know, Cassandra can scale pretty much limitlessly. Um, and so that's not a problem that you have to deal with. So if you're planning to be, you know, the next internet superstar, uh, Cassandra might be your choice. That reminds me of the UK health service at the start of COVID where they were using Excel spreadsheets to record testing and there was after a certain point there were no new rows that could be created and it's sort of like that yeah exactly a global <laughs> scale um, yeah, I, the, you know I think that one of the things I would oh sorry go ahead <laughs> no I got nothing Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, one of the things I would add too is that, you know, when it comes to application developers, um, a lot of the stuff, like when, especially if you're starting out with something new, a, a lot of these problems may be problems you don't currently have right now. There's plenty of people at larger institutions or organizations that do but at the same time. Um, when we start talking about things like web scale and stuff like that, it may sound somewhat intimidating, but that's where the APIs really shine is that, you know, when you know the APIs that are baked into Stargate, the API layer, um, you really don't have to worry about any of that stuff. That's what's really cool about it. So you know, again, you get all these benefits from this amazing database that's powering all of it. But at the same time, you still just, if you want, you can talk to endpoints, or you can um, you can run an SDK or something like that, and it's uh, in in your environment of choice. And I think that that's that's one of the really cool things here is like. Just bringing this tremendous level of power and making it accessible to near mortal developers uh, like myself that um, otherwise, you know, just might not um, might not approach something like this at all. I also want to point out that we have some amazing training resources. We have mm -hmm. um, usually three or four workshops a week, and some of them are like build a Netflix clone on Cassandra with Astra or build a TikTok clone. And some of them are Cassandra fundamentals. We actually have uh, Datastax Academy will we'll, like teach you about Cassandra and then give you a certificate at the end uh, after you take a test. Um, so um, we, we, like I said, we're really committed to getting people excited about this technology. I mean, and you can tell you were mentioning earlier the, um, the free or the limits on that. It was something like 40,000. 40 million. Uh, 40 million. Reads. Uh, oh, 40 million reads. Before, 5 million rights. Wow, before any sort of um, pricing kicks in. Yeah, so it's, and, so it's, and you don't have to give a credit card or anything. Basically, uh-oh, I lost you again. No, no, so I was just going to say, so for like um, take the opportunity who are, aren't yet commercially viable mm -hmm. or who are wanting to test out a new like globally distributed architecture idea, you know, where they're going to use CDNs um, in a variety of different, you know, like, and they want that uptime because they want to promise like, right. like performant um, content streaming or something like that, then they can use, then this gives them that sort of option. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, $25 a month is, uh, we currently have um, uh, wording on the site that says $25 a month, but we're we're trying to push back and say, you know, you get this many reads, you get this many rights, because it's confusing to people. Like, you don't have to put your credit card in. We're not going to ask you for a credit card until you get to, like, 80%. We're going to say, hey, do you want to convert? Um, because, you know, when you get to the $25, you'll be cut off for the rest of the month if you haven't converted but again that's the user's choice it, it at no point do we force somebody to give us their um their financial information and you can have unlimited databases in that wow. in that uh 
And because it's open source, how are you seeing it used by larger clients then? So the enterprises who are maybe um, coming in using the open source side of things, what's their experience um, uh, with um, incorporating um, Astra and, and data stacks and on Stargate into their stack? Most of our enterprise clients are using, still using DSE, the Data Stacks Enterprise uh, product, um, which does a lot of the operations for them. But they take, they actually are mostly using SQL at this time, uh, CQL, sorry, um, and um, and that's that's just because um, Stargate came out like six months ago, so you know it's it's a little too new for for uh netflix to be playing with but um uh i th i think it was um yelp or uh, youtube one of our other uh customers actually said that they were really excited to have those apis because they might hire someone who's a great developer in graphql and this gives them the opportunity to interact with the data in a way that makes sense to them there's no the learning curve is much uh, is much shallower, right? And so they can start being productive faster. It's been going for about six months. With Ash, what's what's on the roadmap? What's the future plans for uh, for, for Stargate? Going? What's your, this time next year at Interface in person probably? Oh, that would be awesome. In person, uh, we can remember what other humans interacting with other humans in real life are like. Um, uh, yeah, that'll be that'll be awesome. And, you know, we're really excited about what the what the future holds for Stargate. I mean, again, it's six months old, but already we've got a ton of APIs that we offer, um, you know, starting with REST and document API and GraphQL. And of course, we're going to see further iterations on those APIs. So, you know, whether it's further enhancements to GraphQL or, uh, you know, kind of taking in developer feedback um, on uh, any of the API surfaces and working with the open source community to tighten those up. But in addition to that, uh, we're looking at supporting gRPC. Um, and that's something that hopefully we'll be talking about next year. But um, gRPC for, you know, those who don't know, and, you know, we're, you know, I'm, I'm really digging into it now myself, but um, is going to offer, um, significant improvements over the network because it actually communicates over HTTP2. Um, and so there's a lot of really good stuff there in terms of not requiring like a constant um, socket-based connection. Um, but uh, some really cool stuff there. And um, one of the main things though that I think I'm personally excited about is that we expect gRPC is actually going to make it easier for us to roll out new language support. Um, and so that's, that's one where we as a company can move faster but i think even even more something that's even a bit more exciting is that this is going to enable a new sort of way for the community to contribute and interact with us as well so you know for example if we come out with a you know an sdk built on top of grpc for something like uh, node.js or um java or Go, for example, there, there may be other languages that, that we may not be able to get to as a company, but we can set certain, you know, kind of like best practices about what it means to build an SDK on top of gRPC for, for Stargate and then welcome co uh, community contributions as well. So I, I'm personally really excited about that because it's going to enable us as a, um, um, as a company and as a, a and with our community to move faster and do more stuff, but also to just uh, be more performant all the way around. Um, so then to, now to finish, you both want to put your uh, the contact details in the chat or maybe just even um, uh, yeah. speak um, to the people. This is the, uh, the recording, I'm not sure, window up. So, so where did they find out? want to give this a try mm -hmm. i'm also i'm you know as you know i'm sinedra on twitter and um uh, everywhere sinedra gmail.com sinedra all all the places uh yeah i'll type it in as well but i'm uh, ash ryan underscore io on twitter not uh, and uh i'm findable on linkedin and uh, feel free to reach out um but yeah thanks thanks so much for having us today 
Did you have any other questions? Okay. Oh, yeah. It's okay. No worries. I, I, I think, you know, hopefully the recording will get. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.